Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you'd care to today. Uh, We're going to pick it up in the book of Numbers, chapter 31, uh, verse 5. And Moses had just been instructed uh, by God to avenge Israel of the Midianites. And the reason for that, the Midianites had seduced Israel into idolatry. And God does not like uh, people that mislead his children. Let's pick it up today. We'll ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father, open eyes, open ears. Let's go with chapter 31, verse 5. So there were delivered out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand of every tribe, 12,000 armed for war, and 12,000 when they had over 601,000 in the army at their disposal from that recent numbering. Uh, But God knew how many it would take for the victory, and it's going to be an amazing victory in in light that they're going up an army against an army that's probably got them outnumbered three to one. Verse 6. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe, them and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to the war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. Now these holy instruments, I think, are not the uh, items of worship uh, such as the uh, altar of burnt offering or the table of showbread or anything of that nature. I think it is referring to the silver trumpets that we covered back in chapter 10. You remember the priests were to blow the trumpets to uh, several uh, call to action uh, in the time of war, which is the case here. Also to call the princes of the tribes. Another signal uh, was given when it was time to break camp and pull up the tent pegs and head for the next place of encampment. Verse 7, now Phinehas, you might remember the one who was so zealous for the Lord when he caught the Midianite woman with the Israelite man in the act of adultery, uh, symbolic of idolatry, and he ran them both through with the javelin, which stopped the plague when 24,000 had died. A lot more probably would have died if not for the zealousness of Phinehas. And they warred against the Midianites, as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. Well, they'll slay all the adult males. Uh, we'll see in the latter part of this chapter that uh, they left the, uh, the males who were not in the battle alive. Verse 8, And they slew the kings of Median, and these were vassal kings of uh, Sihon, king of the Amorites, beside the rest of them that were slain namely Evi and Rechem and Zur, you may remember him, the father of Cosby, uh, who was the Midianite woman who Phinehas ran through with the javelin, and Hur and Reba, five kings of Median, Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. And the last time we read of Balaam was back in chapter 24, verse 25, and he was headed in the direction of home. He would have been a whole lot better off if he would have kept going on home. Uh, But his heart uh, uh, changed forever with the greed uh, of the promise of glory and riches from Balak, the king of the Moabites. But uh, we learn in verse 16 the reason that Balaam was slain was because he was the one uh, who told Balak that the people of Medan and Moab could seduce Israel into idolatry. Verse 9, And the children of Israel took all the women of Medan captives, and their little ones, including the males, and took the spoil 
of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. Uh, the land that they are uh, vacating at this point would become part of the land allotted to uh, Reuben and Gad and half of Manasseh on the east side of Jordan, as we'll see uh, when we get to chapter 32. And they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt, and all their goodly castles with fire. Now, I had mentioned that the Medianites uh, were nomadic peoples. They, they dwelt in tents. They weren't uh, city builders or city dwellers. They moved from place to place with their considerable herds and flocks for the pasture land. So uh, these cities and castles uh, no doubt were built by the Amorites, and Sihon, for example, and the Moabites. Verse 11, and they took all the spoil and all the prey, this being animated uh, booty, you could think of, the animals, in other words, both of men, or humans, and of beasts. Verse 12, and they brought the captives and the prey, these being the animals, and the spoil, this being gold chains, jewelry, things of that nature, which the nomadic peoples were to, uh, known to value very much, even on their camels and their horses, unto Moses and Eleazar the priest, and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto, not into, but unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho, and would Moses be pleased with what he saw. And Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. Now, any time that someone had killed another person, even a soldier killing someone of the enemy in action, uh, or had touched uh, a human corpse, they were unclean for seven days. And if you were unclean, you were not to be within the camp. And of course, they had to go through the purification process, a seven-day uh, process that we covered back in chapter 19 of Numbers with the water of purification. Verse 14, And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. What in the world could Moses be angry about? And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? You know, and here we see dissatisfaction and reproof on the part of Moses. You know, Moses was pretty mild manner, mannered as far as his own uh, concerns. But when it came to matters of the Lord, he was very quick uh, to become, uh, his righteous indignation would flare up in a hurry. These were the same women who had seduced the men of Israel into worshiping Baal Peor and leading them into idolatry. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, the same as Baal Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Do you all remember the 24,000 that were killed by the plague? And if not for Phinehas, a lot more of you would have died. 17. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones. This effectively exterminating uh, the Medianites, and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. In other words, those who were not virgins could very well have been involved in leading the nation of Israel into idolatry. And some of you, I can just hear it, are saying, boy, the Lord is sure mean. No, the Lord is jealous of his children. He doesn't like it when people lead his uh, children into worshiping other fake gods. And you know what? He's going to feel the same about those who falsely teach from the pulpits today and lead his children into believing in a false rapture doctrine, who lead his children into bed, spiritually speaking, 
with the Antichrist himself. And they're set up hook, line, and sinker to be deceived by the Antichrist. And God is going to feel just the way he does toward who, those who lead his children astray then, as he does about these Midianites who led his children astray then. 18, but all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, virgins in other words, keep alive for yourselves. And these, of course, would be made into servants. Verse 19, and do ye abide without the camp seven days, because they were unclean, those who were, had been contaminated with death. Whosoever hath killed any person, and whosoever hath touched any slain, purify both yourselves and your captives, and the young girls in other words, on the third day and on the seventh day, as outlined back in chapter 19. We're getting a pretty good review of what we've covered in Numbers, that water of purification, one of the main ingredients, you'll recall, the, the ashes of a red heifer. Verse 20, and purify all your raiment, and all that is made of skins, and all work of goat's hair, and all things made of wood, all things that could not be passed through fire. Uh, it was necessary for them to be cleansed on the third day and the seventh day in order for them to be considered clean again. Verse 21, And Eleazar the priest said unto the men of war, which went to battle, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 22, only the gold and the silver, the brass, and this word in the Hebrew is nekosheth, and it actually is uh, copper, uh, brass being an alloy uh, essentially made of copper and zinc the iron and tin and the lead. In other words, all metals uh, that could be passed through fire uh, to purify them without melting them or burning them. 23, everything that may abide the fire, ye shall make it go through the fire, and it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation and all that abideth not the fire ye shall make, uh, make go through the water. And in chapter 19, verse 19, uh, the people were also required to uh, wash their clothes and bathe themselves, and then they would be considered clean on that seventh day. And ye shall wash your clothes on the seventh day, and ye shall be clean, and afterward ye shall come into the camp, and this verse should, if you're familiar with Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 25 and 26, and the following verses sound familiar to you, because in the millennium, the God's elect, and they're called the Zadok there in Ezekiel chapter 44, will be allowed in the presence of the millennial temple with Christ. Uh, however, and they will be allowed to go outside of the temple and, and assist, uh, help their immediate family members who didn't make the first resurrection. But there is a price to pay. They will have been in the presence of the dead, the spiritually dead, and therefore they're not allowed to go in the presence of Christ for a period of seven days. 25, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, it's time to... Uh, divvy up the spoils of war. Take the sum, or the count, the booty, of the prey that was taken, both of man and of beast. Thou and Eleazar the priest and the chief fathers of the congregation, the elders uh, representing the uh, people. And again, the only, of the, the people left of Median would be only uh, young girls, virgins who had not lain with man. Verse 27, and divide the prey into two parts, 50-50, right down the middle. Between them that took the war upon them, who went out to battle, and between all the congregation, the 12,000 who put their life at risk 
will receive half of the booty and then the remaining 590,000, if you will, of the fighting men that were numbered will receive the other half. And levy a tribute. Now this word, check it out, tribute, uh, mekez in the Hebrew. And it means to compute the computed value assigned to Yahweh and the Lord. And the only time that you see that term is in this particular chapter. And levy a tribute unto the Lord of the men of war which went out to battle, one soul of five hundred, both of the persons and of the beeves and of the asses and of the sheep. And what's happening here is the Lord claiming for every 500 of the virgin Midianites, one uh, he's claiming to be uh, given to the priest as his representatives. Uh, for every 500 of the oxen or beeves, one was to be given to the priest. Uh, the, the percentage comes out to one-fifth of one percent. It will be a little bit higher for those who didn't risk life and limb in the war. 29, take it of, or from, probably better, their half, and give it unto Eleazar the priest for an heave offering of the Lord. And this, you know, in all probability then, or actuality given to the priest for their maintenance, much as tithes uh, were given as to the Lord, but uh, then as his representatives among the people, the priest received it for their sustenance. And this heave offering, a thank offering uh, for the victory. And don't say, look what I did with my own two hands. If God gives you the victory, and God most certainly gave them the victory in this war, as we'll see as we get toward the end of this chapter, uh, give credit where credit is due and thank the Father. The leaders of the military will give more than what the Lord asked for of one of every 500, as we'll see. Verse 30. And of the children of Israel's half, and these are those who do not go to war, thou shalt take one portion of 50, and that comes out to 2% rather than one-fifth of 1%. 1 of the persons, of the beeves, of the asses, of the flocks, uh, flocks can be either sheep or goats, we'll see that the Midianites did not keep goats, but sheep only, of all manner of beasts, and give them unto the Levites, which keep the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. And these for uh, the benefit of the priest. And this didn't take on the same characteristic as a vow, because vows, uh, clean animals, would have been offered uh, to the Lord as a sacrifice. Uh, unclean animals would have been sold in the money uh, they would have to have been redeemed, as is outlined in Leviticus chapter 27, both the humans and the unclean animals. Verse 31, And Moses and Eleazar the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses. And as I said a moment ago, this is the only place in the Bible that you'll find where the Lord claimed a part of the booty. Now, under King David, the practice of sharing the spoils of war with the congregation uh, pretty much became an accepted rule of thumb. Uh, you can read about in 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, verses 24 and 25, after uh, David's victory over the Amalekites. Now, this is when David had basically a ragtag army of maybe four, five, six hundred men. And you remember they went off to fight against, I believe it was the Ammonites, uh, but the Amalekites came in and took everything that they had, including David's wives. Uh, David caught up with them and wiped them out, but uh, then shared the booty with all of his army. 32, and the booty uh, being the rest of the prey which the men of war had caught was 600,000 and 70,000 and 5,000 sheep, 675,000 sheep. Uh, again, uh, and that's not out of line. This, these were nomadic peoples, and they moved from place to place to keep enough pasture for 
uh, their livestock. The total count, 675,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. And three score and 12,000 beeves, 72,000 bakar in the Hebrew language, which is uh, cattle. It's an old English term, but also uh, of a French word for oxen, uh, it is originated. And three score and 1,000 asses, 71,000 donkeys and 30 and 2,000 persons in all of women that had not known man by lying with him, and 32,000 virgins. And I, in our last lecture, I estimated the army of the Midianites between 35 and 40,000. And if you take that number, you would have, uh, and 32,000 virgins here, young girls, would put the overall population of the Medianites between uh, 130 and 150,000 total population, and therefore that's how I arrived at an estimate of 35 to 40,000 uh, men who were of fighting age. 36, and the half, which was the portion of them that went out to war, was in number 300,007 and 30,500 sheep. Obviously, half of the 675,000 sheep, uh, 337,500. Now, that would come out to approximately, you have 12,000 who went to war. Uh, divide that by 300, or that into 337,500, and that comes out to more than 28 uh, sheep per man who went to war, a pretty good payday, uh, as booties and prey of war often were. 37, and the Lord's tribute of the sheep was 603 score and 15. Of that, they're one-fifth of one percent. They gave 675 uh, to the priests as the Lord's portion. 38, and the beeves were 30 and 6,000, of which the Lord's tribute was three score and 12, 36,000, one half of 1%, equaling 72 uh, head of uh, the beeves that went to the priest. 39, and the asses were 30,500, of which the Lord's tribute was three score and one, 30,500 of the asses, uh, the Lord's portion, 61 head. Now, the asses probably were sold and being unclean animals, and their portion, uh, the value of them, went into the treasury of the sanctuary, no doubt. Verse 40, and the persons, these are the virgins, were 16,000, and that's half of the 32, of which the Lord's tribute was 30 and two persons, probably assigned to menial labor, those assigned to the priest, uh, carrying water, uh, chopping wood, uh, work that the priest normally would have done, but uh, uh, now giving them some help. I don't know how they would have divided up the uh, 16,000, you had 12,000 uh, fighting men, their portion of the virgin slave girls was 16,000. I was curious how they divided them up among themselves, 41. And Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering, unto Eleazar the priest, as the Lord commanded Moses. Remember, these were required. We'll see uh, additional free will offerings given by the leaders of the military in a moment. 42. Of the children of Israel's half, which Moses divided from the men that warred, those who didn't fight, in other words, and note that verses 43 through 46 uh, is parenthetical. It's not in the original manuscripts. Those of you with companion Bibles, you have a, a note on that. In fact, an appendix in six in your companion Bible states this was uh, inserted at a later point in time to explain the context. 43, now the half that pertained unto the congregation was 300,000 and 30,000 and 7,000 and 500 sheep. Again, their half, 337,500. 
and 30 and 6,000 beeves and 30,000 asses and 500 and 16,000 persons. Verse 47, even the children of Israel's half, those who did not go to war, Moses took one portion in 52%, both of man and of beast, and gave them unto the Levites, which kept the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, the priest portion didn't amount to a whole lot when they got one-fifth of one percent of half of the spoils, but this at two percent came out to considerably more because the two percent that the congregation would have given to the tabernacle or the priest would be six thousand seven hundred and fifty sheep, uh, seven hundred and twenty cattle or oxen, six hundred and ten asses, and three hundred and twenty of the young maidens, so a considerably higher number you might ask, well, what in the world would the priest do with all those animals? Well, uh, when they got into the promised land, uh, the uh, priest cities, well, in fact, every walled city, the priests were allocated a certain amount of land adjacent to the walls of the city. Uh, the larger the city, the more land that was given because the land depended on on how long the walls of the city were. But the priests were, were not given an inheritance in the land, don't misunderstand. But, of course, they had to have a place to keep their livestock, and these livestock uh, got them a pretty good start in the promised land. 48, and the officers, which were over thousands of the host, the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds, came near unto Moses. Now, these are the officers who led the 12,000 fighting men into war. It's time to take a casualty count. And they said unto Moses, Thy servants have taken the sum, or the count, of the men of war which are under our charge. In the Hebrew, this is under our hand. Uh, today, we would probably more likely say under their command. And there lacketh not one man of us. Wow! Do you understand that? 12,000 went to war against 35 to 40,000 of the Midianites, and they didn't lose one soldier, not one man. I tell you, that's, that's the side I want to be on when, when we go to war, and we are going into a spiritual war in the very near future. Uh, I encourage you to be on the side that God is not going to allow one to be lost. Verse 50. We have therefore brought an oblation, these are the officers, they continue, a voluntary offering for the Lord. What every man hath gotten of jewels, of gold, chains and bracelets, rings, earrings and tablets to make an atonement for our souls before the Lord. They're saying here, we just simply are not worthy of God's grace and, 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 and keeping us alive and all of our men alive uh, when we went into battle. So their offering is, is a free, truly a free will offering. God didn't claim part of that. Uh, he did claim uh, part of the, the other booty and prey, but and they're doing this of their own accord giving God the credit for their victory and for the preservation of not only their lives, but the lives of their men as well. 51, and Moses and Eleazar the priest took the gold of them, even all the rock jewels. 52, and all the gold of the offering, the heave offering, that they offered up to the Lord of the captains of thousands and of the captains of hundreds was 16,750 shekels. That's a lot of gold, my friends. 53, for the men of war had taken spoil every man for himself, the spoils of war. And, you know, at this time, often men would uh, offer themselves up as mercenaries. And I don't think very much of mercenaries as far as soldiers, but uh, they would literally make themselves available to fight for 
a particular nation in hopes that they would be able to uh, take some of the spoils and the booty of war. They'd risk their life for the opportunity uh, to share in the booties and spoils of war. 54, and Moses and Eleazar the priest took the gold of the captains of thousands and of hundreds and brought it into the tabernacle of the congregation for a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord, no doubt placed in the uh, treasury of the sanctuary. Now, chapter 32, we have a little situation comes up. Uh, now the land, a lot of it on the east side of Jordan, has been vacated by the war with the Midianites. And uh, Reuben and Gad and half Manasseh uh, had a lot of cattle uh, and, and flocks, and they saw that the land was good, had a lot of water, and they said, let us take our land here on this side of the Jordan. Let's get started in chapter 32, verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place of cattle. And they had a lot of cattle. And these are regions on the east of Jordan, Jazer and Gilead. A lot of people referred to them over the centuries as paradise because of the prized pasture lands and access to water. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, half tribe of Manasseh uh, would also be included with this petition of Reuben and Gad. We had regions mentioned now, cities. Verse 3, Ataroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliale and Shebam and Nebo and Beon. All of these uh, cities on the east side of Jordan. Verse 4, even the country which the Lord smote. Who smote the country of the Midianites? Well, remember, they didn't lose one soldier on the Israelites' army, so uh, pretty obvious who smote them. Before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle, plenty of pasture, plenty of water. Verse 5, Wherefore say they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let us land, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. And boy, I can see the wheels turning in Moses' head as they petition him with that request. You remember what happened back in chapter 14 when the people would not go into the promised land that God that was God's will that he bring them out of Egypt and take them into the promised land, the land of Canaan. Now the, the Gadites and the Reubenites and half of Manasseh are saying, we don't want to go into the promised land. Moses is probably thinking, uh-oh, here we go again. But he'll take their petition to the Lord, being the intercessor that Moses is. Uh, don't miss the next lecture, and we'll see what the Lord said to the uh, people of Gad and Reuben and half Manasseh with their request to take their inheritance, take their land of milk and honey on the east side of Jordan. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example 
of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the United States, and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. If you're studying by internet or shortwave radio from somewhere around the world, other than the places I just mentioned that can use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in as well being the point. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive format, throwing out negative about others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, uh, the correcting, and the healing. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the 800 number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need paper and pencil and a mailing address. You know, God created a unique way in which you can communicate with him anytime, anywhere, any place. You don't even have to speak out loud. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. So all you have to do is think it, and you are communicating with him. So, And I encourage you to talk to your father. You know, I don't think you have a lot of competition. It seems like we live in a particularly evil generation. Uh, people uh, are so caught up in the ways of the world that they don't have time for their heavenly father. And when you make time for him, and, and especially studying his word each day, it's very special to him. You're a very special child to him. Blessings will follow. We do have these prayer requests. Father, we come to you united as one in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. They have illnesses in their families, uh, problem relationships that need a touch of your healing, uh, and those who have addictions to alcohol, drugs, Father. You know the needs of all these. If it is thy will, a special blessing on each of these. And as always, we remember our military troops who are around the world in harm's way. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal, and you should, Jesus' precious name, amen, and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions, see what's on the mind of folks. First up today, we have Jay and Mary in Arkansas. My wife and I are 100% disabled. Uh, we receive SSDI. Uh, we were both baptized before the age of accountability, so we baptized each other in our bathtub. In your opinion, will God... Uh, Christ and the Holy Spirit accept our baptisms of each other. 100% absolutely yes. Uh, now, there are some other churches that might not accept your baptism, but uh, God certainly will. And any Christian can baptize another. James in Iowa, and thank you for your kind comments. Uh, question. I grew up on a farm in southern Iowa, and we raised livestock and crops to feed the livestock. I was quite shocked when you stated that pork was not a proper meat. Dad always butchered an animal when we needed meat on the table. We always had plenty of eggs, and a normal breakfast was bacon and eggs. Have we sinned all this time? Your program that day was the first I was aware that uh, some animals are unclean and some ray was not were not raised to be consumed. Please help me with this matter. Okay, James and uh, Leviticus chapter 11 verse 7. God makes it very clear that we're not to eat swine's flesh. Uh, they're unclean, and I think the reason is that uh, swine. Uh, do not have perspiration glands. And, and everything that they consume that's poisonous goes right into their fat. And when you eat that, you're eating all that poison. It's unhealthy for you. Now, uh, it's a sin against your flesh, not a sin against your soul, not to follow God's health laws. And then there are some who, of course, will try and tell you, well, all that changed in the New Testament because God, uh, in Acts chapter 10, he lowered those unclean animals to Peter, and that made it okay to eat unclean animals. That's not what happened in Acts chapter 10 at all. Peter didn't eat. Three times God lowered those unclean animals. 
and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, No, Lord, I've ne my, my lips have never touched anything unclean. And along about verse 28 to 29, we learn what God was trying to teach Peter and us, and that is you don't call any man unclean, uncommon or unclean. And Gentile, uh, Christianity was about to be opened up to the Gentiles is what was going on there. And God was teaching Peter, you don't hold back the gospel from the Gentiles. And that's the way it is. Uh, Patty in Maryland, dear Pastor Dennis, and thank you for your very kind comments. Uh, thanks to your ministry, I can understand God's word more clearly, and you have made me cry with joy uh, to finally be able to read and understand his word. And his word is oh so powerful and, and touches our hearts in special ways uh, when we understand his word. Uh, please answer these questions for me, if you would. Uh, God bless, I love you, and we love you as well. How do you teach God's Word without looking like you are an, on an ego trip or like a know-it-all? I want to pass on what I am learning, but don't want to look to other people like I think I'm better than them. And that's a very good thing to be concerned about, especially if you are interested in communicating God's word. And if you don't want to look like a know-it-all, don't be a know-it-all. I certainly don't know everything that there is. I learn, thank God, I learn from his word every day. And I certainly am not afraid or ashamed at any time to say, you know, I don't know. Let's roll up our sleeves and, and dig into his word and see if we can find out. So um, my wife, Marion, has a, a, a hat pin that's about this long, too. And anytime she sees my ego starting to get out of whack, she pops that balloon like, I mean, that quick. And, that, you know, keep yourself humble is the key. Be humble before the Lord. Edith in Georgia, humble yourself and he will raise you up. He'll exalt you. Uh, if you exalt yourself, be prepared to be brought down because that's the teaching of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Edith in Georgia, where in the Bible does it say you have to pay 10% for your tithes? Well, it doesn't say you have to pay 10% for your tithes, but the very word tithe in the Old Testament means a tenth or 10%. Priscilla in Pennsylvania, do you believe in hell? Uh, I discovered your program and I thoroughly enjoy it and have recommended it to other people. Recently, I told someone in my church about you and they said you don't believe in hell. And that's not correct. We do teach that there is a hell. Uh, the hell that that is in God's word, you'll find, you know, let me first of all say, in basically the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, about 95% of the time I would guess that the word hell is utilized. Uh, it actually means the grave, Sheol in the Hebrew language, Gehenna in the Greek language, and it means the grave. Um, and the point I wanted to make to you, though, the lake of fire of Revelation chapter 19, after the great white throne judgment, uh, Satan goes into the lake of fire, that is hell, and consumed, and those who follow him, God is a consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Um, and how do I know that there's not a continual hell? Because uh, you can read in, in Revelation chapter 20, uh, 21, let me say and that, and by the way, the hell, lake of fire is in Revelation 20 that Satan goes in, but in 21, you can read about God's throne coming to earth, and God wipes the tears away from his children's faces, and there is no more death, there is no more sorrow, and if there was a continual hell, and you saw your relatives over there in excruciating pain throughout the eternity, uh, rolling around in hell, uh, don't you think you might have a little tear or a little sorrow uh, for them? Uh, I think you would. So uh, those who teach that hell is for all eternity, uh, I believe, are incorrect. Uh, but there is a hell, and we teach a hell. Penelope in Oregon. 
Would you please explain Matthew 24, 17, uh, where it talks about running to the mountains? Is that spiritual or literal? And it is literal. Uh, and what it's being said there, Christ's instructions, Matthew 24, uh, the events that must come to pass before he returns. And one of the things that Jesus said will come to pass is when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that of course, standing in the holy place, that is, of course, Daniel predicted that, prophesied that Satan and his role as Antichrist would be standing in the temple claiming to be God, claiming to be Jesus Christ. And uh, when that occurs, Jesus says, literally, get out of Judea, flee for the mountains. Robert in Louisiana, uh, will the great white throne judgment be on earth or in heaven? I know God will redo or rejuvenate, I'll say, the earth as in the first earth age. And you're right, God is going to set everything back the way it was originally. I think, and it's, it would be pretty tough to prove one way or the other because it's not really stated, it will occur, no doubt. I think the great white throne judgment will be here on earth. Janice in Washington, uh, is Jesus God in the flesh or the manifestation of his love? What part of Jesus is the comforter? Is the comforter the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus said while on the cross, he had to leave so the comforter could come and said that he goes to his father's house to sit on the right hand of God. And, you know, you're kind of mixing a few things up. I don't believe Christ said that from the cross. Uh, but in John chapter 14, he certainly said what you're talking about, and that is he goes to prepare a place, a house for the disciples. And uh, he said, but don't be worried. I, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Uh, I'm going to leave you the comforter. And that, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Um, in your first question, is Jesus God in the flesh? He was called the Son of Man in the flesh. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, prophecy 635 years before Christ was born, that a virgin would conceive and a male child would be born, and we were to call his name Emmanuel, which if you in, you know, translate that, it means God with us. Crystal in North Carolina, please explain the conception that some people celebrate on December 25th. And if you choose to celebrate that time of year, how would you do it without offending the Lord by worshiping any false idols? Our family knows that Jesus was not born on the 25th, but conceived on the 25th of December. We are new students and want to learn the truth and do what is right. Thank you, and you're sure welcome, Crystal. And uh, You know, there's nothing wrong with celebrating the conception of Jesus Christ. And the, the word became flesh, and beloved, that certainly uh, is something to celebrate. Now, you, you talk about worshiping idols. Now, if you're talking about uh, a Christmas tree, if you don't worship the Christmas tree, it's not an idol. So, uh, and in the Old Testament, in the, the, the Minor Prophets, God would say, I am a mighty uh, fir tree at one point. So uh, nothing wrong with having a tree. In fact, is uh, I believe that if we become uh, our children, if we become so strict that they see other families celebrating Christmas by exchanging gifts and having a tree and uh, allowing a little bit of the traditions of men, Santa Claus, for example, etc. But if we become so strict that we tell our children, no, we're not going to worship uh, Christmas. We're not going to have any fun like the other people because our religion, you're turning your kids off 
to religion, I'm afraid, uh, by doing so. So uh, don't celebrate it as a religious holiday. Celebrate it as the conception day of Jesus Christ. If that means your family wants to exchange gifts, nothing wrong with that. If that means you want to put up a tree in your house, uh, nothing wrong with that. Roy in South Carolina, just don't worship the tree. If God truly mourned when Lucifer fell, why doesn't God give him and his angels a second chance like us? Okay, Roy, let's say uh, God decided to give Satan and the fallen angels a second chance. And the Lord came to you, Roy, and said, okay, Roy from South Carolina, uh, I'm giving Satan and all of his fallen angels a second chance and they got the houses right next to yours. Your house is going to be right smack dab in the middle of Satan, and the whole neighborhood is going to be full of fallen angels throughout the eternity. Does that sound like a good deal to you, Roy? Uh, it doesn't sound like a very good deal to me, and we don't want Satan in the eternity. Satan has had uh, more than one chance. Why do I know that? Because God is fair, always fair. Blanche in Oklahoma, uh, thanks for the Bible study. You're sure welcome. We enjoy teaching. Genesis 1.14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, the sky, as you put in parentheses, to divide the day from the night and let them for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The fourth day, question, does this mean there was no sun in the first earth age, uh, ice age, she writes in parentheses, and you're, you're thinking flesh, Blanche, and try and put your spiritual thinking cap on when, when you have trouble, you know, identifying with something in God's word. A lot of times it's because we're so tied up in the flesh, we can't think spiritual. Our spiritual eyes are closed, so try and open them up. Uh, I'd refer you to Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. That's in the eternity, and there is no need, as it states there, for the sun, neither the moon, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So think spiritual. Kathleen in Ohio, since I haven't studied the Bible in years, and I'm glad you're studying again now, uh, Kathleen. Who are the Nicolaitans mentioned in Revelation 2.15? And it's obvious there by what Christ says about them that he's not at all happy with the Nicolaitans. And it's not written there uh, who they are or what they believed, but uh, most uh, scholars, uh, the thinking is that they were Baal worshipers. Page in Oregon, and Page is 12 years old. How come we people on earth have no memories of heaven since we've been uh, here before? Why can't we remember? And that's a good question. And uh, Page, I think the reason that God gives us limited uh, intellectual capacities in the flesh to where we can't remember what happened in the first earth age is that and the whole purpose of this earth age is to give everybody a chance to follow God. And by that, I mean the third who followed Satan in the first earth age. Uh, God wants them to have a chance to follow him this time. And uh, this gives everybody a clean, fresh start with equal opportunity, not knowing uh, possibly what our failures were if we were among that third in the first earth age. It's a good question. Uh, another good question might be to follow that is, will we be able to remember the first earth age uh, when we are in the third earth age? And I think we'll have the intellectual capacity at that time uh, to, to do so. Paris in North Carolina. Does Satan have power over the weather? And Revelation 13, 13 states that he will be able to make fire come down from heaven. That's phos in the Greek, that's lightning. And you better believe he's gonna have that power and you better be uh, spiritually and mentally prepared for him to utilize that power. Don't let him see you sweat on your first cruise. 
Chris in Oklahoma, where in the Bible does it say that Israel is God's favorite place? Well, it can be taken common sense from Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. And it states there that God spread his skirt over Jerusalem, which is a Hebraism, a Hebrew figure of speech, which means he took Jerusalem uh, to wife. Uh, that also is where his throne is going to be established and when he returns to earth in Revelation uh, chapter uh, 21 and 22. Chris in California, where in the Bible are the dinosaurs? When in the Bible were they alive? Well, in Job uh, chapter 40, I believe that God describes the dinosaurs where he calls them behemoth. And if you'll take a sixth grader and give them a pencil and paper or coloring uh, crayons and paper and ask them to draw as you read the description of behemoth, uh, what you'll get is a whole lot looking like a dinosaur because that's what God was talking about. And they existed on earth uh, in the first earth age. But uh, at Satan's rebellion, when God shook the earth, uh, the dinosaurs became extinct at that time. Sue in Kentucky, in Zephaniah 317, where it says, He will rejoice over thee with singing. Uh, when has this happened or has it happened yet? Can you tell me who thee is? And it's future. It's God talking about he will rejoice uh, over the overcomers. Uh, that's his elect who overcome the tribulation of Antichrist. I'm out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying God's word more in depth than most others. It makes God's day when he looks down and he sees you with your Bibles open, studying the letter that he wrote to you, seeking knowledge from him. It makes his day, friend, and blessings will always follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important, though, and that's this, you stay in Father's Word every day, and His Word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.